I'm here with Xani, Hakadosh, Toto, Pacifilia. Okay, and we're here to see Spectre. So I will have just one question for you guys. What are you expecting from Spectre tonight? I'm guessing I want something a bit new. I really like the previous James Bond, but it was kind of too simple for me, like no gadget, nothing. So I want something like exciting. Like, you want gadget? Yes, big gadget, robot killer, stuff like that. Okay. Persephilia? Nothing. You, you're, not ex- <laughs> you're not expecting anything. You've seen Casino Royale yesterday. It was boring. <laughs> Come on, it's awesome. Okay. I'm actually, uh, I am ready to be uh, disappointed. Okay. I saw, I read some critics and they say it's a bit like the one back in Roger Moore time with lots of stupid jokes. No spoilers. No, no, spoilers. no, 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 no. I haven't actually, I haven't read any spoilers, but lots of stupid jokes, a bit uh, too easy and uh, too incredible. It doesn't work anymore. And I must say, I never liked James Bond. And, but... <laughs> Um, unless I mean since Casino Royale I like those ones and when are you gonna play poker with us that's you answer that later <laughs> okay <laughs> my own expectations here I haven't watched any trailer I hope it's good I didn't like Skyfall so it was boring so I'd like it to be more fun I'd like as many references to Honor Majesty Secret Service as possible I'd like some humor but I'd like it well balanced so we'll see Totoshan, what are you expecting from Spectre tonight? Just something entertaining. I don't really remember most of the uh, 007 movies, to be honest. And since Casino Royale is not quite English, and I, I, I kind of like this English humor touch. Um, yeah, we were talking it's about the opposite this. opposite of me, then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember we were talking about Kingsman earlier. Um, and I kind of like this kind of style in 007 but there's none yet so far and I don't like the old ones old old ones because they're kind of well sexist yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, old one like Roger Moore one or Sean Connery ones uh, anything before the the Casino modern Royal. yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay well let's go and let's see Spectre and we will record if the movie is matching or very low expectations Welcome among the Rollist, your London-based tabletop RPG podcast. I'm here again with Gary and James. Hello. Hello. There's a big event coming soon. Pector is coming out. And I thought it was a good opportunity for us to discuss about probably one of the most famous Britons out there. James Bond. Gary and James, are you James Bond fans? I, I would say I am, actually. Um... I don't think, don't think there's a point when I'm not secretly excited to uh, the next film coming out. And you know, there's lots of trepidation about what you actually think it's going to be like, but secretly inside you go, I hope it's good. In some ways, I don't, I don't particularly care if James Bond, it just sells it to me straight away. It's like, <laughs> it's just like, you know it's going to be awesome. It always is. No, James Bond, definitely. I've been watching it since I was like um, seven, six years old. So James Bond's huge for me. Absolutely love it. So that, that leads to the question, actually, what was your first experience of James Bond? What was the first time you, you, you saw it in somewhere or you saw an actual movie? Cinema. My father took me to see Octopussy, Roger Moore. Ah. And uh, absolutely love it. Uh, it's one of my earliest memories as well. And from that moment onwards, James Bond's always been kind of special because it was the first thing I saw in a cinema that I can remember. So, so. what about you, James? I think it was more I saw the repeats on TV and it was something that my dad used to watch and he used to, you know, he was on and he used to watch it and, you know, it, it, enjoyable. But I think what really caught me caught up in it is when you actually, like, go to school um, and you talk about the, 
what is it, Goldeneye, the, your video game. Because that was when the when P- Pierce Brosnan became James Bond. There was a lot of talk about how, like, again, every time we move over to a new James Bond, everyone says they're not going to be that good. But everyone enjoyed doing it with Pierce Brosnan and with it being Goldeneye and then the, the game. That was the the hook for me that the, that got me into there. That uh, little niche there, and everyone enjoyed that. And that was in its own little flavour there. It was like everyone enjoyed the game, and that's what got it a niche in that market because it was it was the N sixty four actually. Yeah, it was yeah. the N sixty four, and then the first time I saw it, to be honest, I thought it looked weird with the ads and the three D. What was a bit weird, but yeah, it was definitely a, a great game, and it's probably one of. The James Bond who are also the most part of, you know, my, me growing up. I, I could not tell myself which James Bond was the first one I saw because I, I caught them on TV. I, so I remember mm. seeing bits and, bit and pieces. The first one I saw in theater was License to Kill, uh, with Timothy Dalton. Yeah. And brutal I, James Bond. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I brought my father there. I like James Bond. I want to see that movie. And he, he was, he was quite shocked, uh, <laughs> at the end of the movie. <laughs> I, I remember the, the trailer and I was never able to find that trailer online. A trailer for License to Kill, which was just the, the, one of the goon of the villain telling what happened to him, to his boss. Telling him, so my guys were in the plane and uh, the guy started swimming after the plane and you got the boss like, yeah, right. Then he climbed into the plane and you see bits of pieces without seeing the face of, of Bond and the boss is really like, yeah, right, you, you, you're telling me rubbish right now. Yeah, I'm, so you, I'm, I'm, I'm going to kill you. I think I remember that. That's not one where he, where he uh, got into the, the Ferrari and got out the back of the, the plane and like... He's water skiing behind his plane, actually. It's always oh, oh, that one. Oh, okay. And wasn't yeah. the car had water skis or something? So uh, it's James Bond. It's James, so James Bond. Bond. So it's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he's water skiing and his friend is coming with a helicopter and they, they hook the plane to the helicopter and that's the <laughs> opening credit. And yeah, that was it. So your Bond, Gary, then is Roger Moore? No. I mean, I think, I think this is, this is the thing, you see. It's the big topic, isn't it? What Bond was the best Bond, isn't it? So, and I think it always comes down to your tastes. It depends what you, what you like. I mean, uh, Sean Connery is the, the classic one that everybody says, oh, he was the best one because he was the one that saw it. You know, Fleming wanted to be the main Bonds. Mm. You know, he had that whole Scottish heritage. Well, that, he that fits in. That he, fits in quite well. He retconned James Bond to be Scottish. Yeah. Because he was not Scottish initially. No, no, he was born, he came, his family's from Scotland, but he was born in England, Bond. I, no, I think that, yeah, the, the Ian Fleming retconned James yeah. Bond because he liked so much Sean Connery that he said, okay, I'm going to make, it, it was probably not mentioned specifically before and Fleming decided, okay, I'm going to make him from a Scots black background to, yeah. to match the movies, I think. I don't know. I think no, no, it's, it's worth, worth. I mean, I'm not that diehard to go straight into it and go into all the roots of it all. And then you got um, Daniel Craig, which is, I think, the uh, more of the 21st century Bonds, and I think he's done it perfectly for the like the modern sort of Bonds. So I guess it depends on really what you grow up with. I mean, I grew up with Roger Moore. So he yours more is... A, he's more com- I mean, if I had to pick one, I think Daniel Craig, because I kind of mm. like the modern sort of side of things, but I'll always have something special for Roger Moore, because that was the first Bond I saw. Uh, so it's got big memories for me. So James, Pierce Brosnan, that's going to be controversial. Yeah, I mean... Um, uh, I like Brosnan. Yeah, I, mean, <laughs> I think... I think, I think for, for me, I think it was it's going to be Pierce Brosnan to start with, but like, Daniel Craig is definitely got a, got a place in my heart. Because there's certain Pierce Brosnan like Bond moments which I remember definitely. It was like, for example, there's like twelve. Okay, let's take for example the film Gold Knives. You already mentioned that, which is the when, best. Yeah, yeah. The the uh, the the grenade pen. The grenade. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. It gets yeah, it three yeah. times. The sort of thing. It's like it's those little Bond moments which he has that just basically just puts the the edge of flair on it because anyone could be you know, anyone could be a spy. It's like in the in the artificial sort of thing, but you want to be a double O. You have to do that little bit of flair. And Pierce Bronson always seemed to do that. The the, the little jokey bits of the quips, and also the, for example, all right, then he's going. It's like he got he's only got like uh, one pistol, and there's like ten guys. <laughs> so he shoot, he shoots out the the steam pipe, and then is able to escape that way. It's those little flair moments, of, you know, to I give mean, it a little bit of bondsness to it. I remember the the ultimate 
Bond moment for me in GoldenEye is this chase with a Russian tank and goes through a wall <laughs> and he's just uh, setting it's a crazy it's, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah that's awesome <laughs> but he, he does that in a couple of them uh, I remember that's where we went under the, under under the, the water, water in the Thames and then he comes yeah, back up just, time, just yeah. like, I think that's his little quirk thing I think I'm quite uh, of a snob and a hipster in the sense of I always liked the classic one so I would root for Sean Connery I love Daniel Craig. I, I really like Pierce Brosnan. I think it's a shame in a way because I, as much as I like Brosnan, after GoldenEye, I, I like Tomorrow Never Dies, but after GoldenEye, some people say it's, it's the best gentleman with the worst movies. Some people say mm. that. Uh, Daniel Craig, I love Daniel Craig. And actually, we can move into the after in my next question, which would be what's your favorite Bond movie and Casino Royale. It's, although Connery is my favorite Bond, my favorite Bond movie is Casino Royale. But Craig, it, it kind of, it's a bit of a shame that things went, took so long between Casino Royale and Quantum of Solace and Writer Strike and Quantum of Solace was a bit disappointing. difficulties as well. Yeah. And then, and then you got this guy full vibe like, oh, I'm too old for this. And you're like, you only three movies in. That's, <laughs> that's a bit. It's been I, I don't know. I don't know. Sad. I think they've done, um, I think they've done something good with this is, for example, um, I can honestly say this is like the first time they've actually done something really, really sensible but kind of kept it hidden from the public because they didn't really say because if you look at the way that they did Casino Royale they've done a, a revamp because the Casino Royale was originally done as a I think it was a straight to TV movie I think it was yeah and, there's also and, and it was also a, 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 radio, a radio thing and it wasn't <laughs> that great but anyway so it hadn't been a proper Bond film mm. done by the studios and but what they've done here is they go, right, we're doing Casino Royale. And I was like, well, it's the old story. It's already been done, but okay, it's not been a proper Bond film. Let's, let's watch it. And they didn't mention any of the different extras and flares, and they even had the same old M in there. So it just basically made it a little bit timey, wimey, confusing. No one actually knew whether it was before or after or what. And they didn't answer any of the questions. They just went into it. And then as it's come on, the second film, you kind of, they've released a bit more. And as you can kind of see now... They've gone back to the start. But they never said that. <laughs> they've done it, and every, they've got people hooked into it, and now you're not getting people up in arms and complaining about it, and saying, oh, no, you know, they can't, you know, they're just redoing it again. It's going to be terrible. They, they've kind of gradually allowed people to get there on their own course. Now, now when the Spectre's coming out, when you actually have the organisation Spectre, mm. they're actually going, well, I've got three films under uh, there already, or two, is it two films? Right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they, they've got these films under under his belt already, and they like get to this point now, and you you got the crowd actually following you, so you're not getting the rejection. So it's, I think it's kind of smart what they've done. Mm, they, they, it's definitely smart. Which one would be your favourite, Gary? Yeah, Casino Royale. Yeah, so I like I like the grittiness of that movie. Mm. I like how real an impact it is, and I like the whole introduction to the movie. It's one of my favourite cars, in the Aston Martin. You <laughs> that particular model, I absolutely love. So to me, it's just like, wow, you get a nice little... You've got some great scenes in it, the whole poker playing and all that. It really caught the whole element of James Bond's. Uh, but then um, GoldenEye is really good. I really, really like GoldenEye. Again, uh, like we discussed earlier, I'm not too sure about, you know, the star in it myself, but it was still really enjoyable Bond's. But uh, yeah, Casino Royale for me. I, I would have to actually agree with Gary. I, I think that's what, this is the reason why it's a bit of a difficult thing. Because you've got the, the actor in the and um, the, the film. There's two separate things that I really did like the Casino Royale because of the way in it, the way he told his story, and actually you did actually have a lot of uh, a lot of flavour in the character's development. You actually saw weaknesses and strength of moments, and and also. The really, really clever moments in it, uh, there. I mean, well, though. He's such a different James Bond as well. He's put his own real mark on it, which makes it unique as well. Yeah. I think that's what makes from, it. I mean, from the first he's scene, got, he's there. He's vulnerable. You, you can also see that he's vulnerable as well. So, he, you know, yeah, he's the, the tough James Bond's character, but you can see he's, but you know, he's kind of human at the same time. And, that they're not, he's not so perfect. You see this whole yeah. development going through right from the beginning, and he's not completely invincible. And I think that's that gritty sort of side of thing I was talking about earlier. But the other James Bond is like, ah, I've been shot, so what? Let's carry on going. <laughs> I mean, I think that one of my friends actually mentioned to me how the 
what Ian Fleming actually did with regards to his the whole makeup of it, and that's to show that James Bond isn't a gentleman. Because <laughs> one of the things he actually goes is the alcoholic drink he has. Uh-huh. Because uh, it's meant to be um, the, the way the difference between the shaken and the stirred. Because if you have it stirred, it's meant to allow a, like a much smoother a taste and allow you to. It's a sipping drink. Uh-huh. Whereas if you shake it, it just pushes these flavours together, and it's just just to get you drunk. <laughs> okay, it's a binge that. drinker. Though. Yeah, so it's essentially get it down your neck. He was, was a bit of a womanizer as well, yeah. wasn't he? I mean, there was um... living in the moment. Yeah. Suppose if you're that, that kind of trade, you're going to have to. Yeah. <laughs> have you yeah. read the, the actual Casino Royale uh, book? Because I took uh, a moment. It's very short, uh, and it, it's quite fascinating or or different. Well, first of all, so it's Casino Royale, the first one. Uh, it's really weird because all the context of it is a uh, French post-war. So it's about unions of uh, miners. So the le chiffre mm-hmm. is uh, the guy managing the money for the Soviet Union of miners union which are supposed to be uh you know backdoor invasion army or threat to to the us the uk and, and france so and it, it's really weird because even the the amount of money they mention is like well ten thousand franc <laughs> it sounds like like nothing but but james bond doesn't sound at all like this smooth guy is very sharp very direct and quite Oh yeah, almost despicable. You don't want really to hang out with this guy. And an interesting detail: the the last line of the book is one of the line of the actual movie Casino Royale is the bitch is dead. <laughs> Sorry for the curse, <laughs> but about Vesper. But why in the movie it's sort of you can see that he says that maybe he doesn't think it really, and M is like, yeah, everybody's seeing through you and see that uh, you're not thinking that. In the book, it really feels like cold. I'm glad she's gone because she she was luggage for me. It's really, really weird. Funny to move on next question because we we've been mentioning so so many things. You you mentioned something interesting I find to to jump into role playing games is uh, the fact that in Casino Royale you've got a new bond. No mention ever is made that about this theory that bond would be a code name for people and there would be multiple bond. And you did 
Mm. You become James Bond the day you become 007, and that wouldn't make any sense with Skyfall. But M is there, and she's been there all the way through with Brosnan. And what I find interesting with role-playing games is that, in a way, we always play these multiverse things of replaying the same stories with elements which remain, but the stories are different. Well, have you ever played any of the James Bond uh, role, tabletop role-playing games? I have played it many, many years ago. It's, I mean, it's an old classic game. Uh, I even believe it got an award at one point as well. It's, it's, it's really good. Uh, it's like 1983 or 84 it came out. 83, yeah. And it's more based on the whole Moore days, you know, Roger Moore. So it's a bit dated now, which is a bit of a problem for it. I think someone needs to come along and redo the whole James Bond side of things. Uh, but it's good. It's a good system. It's percentile. Use the heroic system, which I think is a really good. You know, you definitely need that element in a role playing game. But yeah, I I've, I've played it. Um, it was a it was a tough game to to play as a player on it because everybody who was playing in it wanted to be 007 James Bond. I don't think you can do that really in any game if you're playing with other people. Everyone wants to be the hero, but if everyone's a hero, no one's a hero. So you know, if you give people different heroic moments. To basically say, for example, the talker, the the fighter, the the, the mechanic, or whatever yeah. it is, yeah, they're playing in that in whichever game is. But the, each player has to know that they they have a percentage of time which they are the hero. But that, there's a thing. Uh, I got this game, the the James Bond Double Seven. You we we mentioned from 1983. I got the French version. I haven't mastered or played it yet, but I, I've been considering it uh, quite strongly. But what I was thinking as a game master was that. I didn't want it to have more than two players. And even the people I have in mind to play with me are a guy and a girl. And I was thinking about them like a a sort of a duo. Uh, I don't remember this 80s TV show, which was kind of spy-like like like this with with a duo. But I, I think as soon as you have more than two players, it's not James Bond anymore. It's Mission Impossible, where you got this... Or, you know, the, the team. team. Yeah. I think it depends how you, you can run it as a James Bond. You could effectively do them all, as in they haven't got their double O status yet. Mm. So, you, you know, you're all none of, you're all newbies into this and you're going for the academy or wherever. So, and you say, you sent spaces like, none of you, so you have a group of four people, none of you double O's. So you can create that whole progression level with them to develop them in something. So maybe, hopefully, control them not to the 007 James Bond stereotype and create their own sort of unique sort of side of things and create your own unique spin. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Instead of just... Because uh, then you can have more players. If you're jumping straight in, guy, you're a double O. So you, you'll be the... This, you'll be defaulting straight to the 007, You'll be this, this team of guys or, or girls playing in the, and in the background, you would have a double O. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> doing something and maybe you're cleaning the mess behind. What I would expect you, you would need to do also as a GM is that you, you've got a lot of games like oh, I remember a game of c- Cyberpunk where uh, everybody's you know they can be a bit uh, frozen in the sense of uh, they are very concerned about falling into any traps mm. and dying or whatever. So you spend hours thinking about a plan to get in in a place because you are. You are most playing against a game master. You you want to mm. to cut any chance to to be to be taken. I think there's sort of a, an agreement with the game master, which is like, okay, you're the star. Things won't be uh, without surprise, without challenge, but things gonna go great and fun, and you're not gonna die like an idiot over there killed by a goon because mm. you're you're this James Bond sort character and. If you fail at something, there will be a consequence, which will be bad, but it would still be, well, you would be attached to that table with that laser, but, uh, <laughs> and that would be the bad situation for you, but you, you won't die in a, you know, put your players like, okay, we can dare to do things and not be too scared about, it's not like a vampire game where you would be always uh, careful about yeah. whatever, whatever you do. I think it's the style of GMing you have to do. You have to obviously, I mean, if you're doing James Bond, you're going to have to have a nice heroic and you're going to have to go, oh, you can do two players like James, uh, when James suggests more, and I tend to agree with James, actually. I think you need more because that gives more flexibility to the players and I think the players ultimately uh, create that flavour of that game and the GM's there as a, as a guide, ultimately. 
you go into different systems. Yeah, vampire, you're going to create the whole paranoia sort of thing. And yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, it, it depends on the systems. I think it, it really will ultimately boil down to that GM and how you're going to shape it and how you're going to influence it. I mean, it, but, it, yeah, I was gonna yeah, I agree with Gary though. It, it, you have to be very aware of whatever system you're you're playing, and like you're saying in the vampire setting, it's like world of darkness. It's a horror genre. The player should be scared quite a lot of the time. But in, in if you're doing James Bond, you want to be heroic. Yeah. I think actually a lot of my friends actually mentioned this to me. I've like, I've not played James Bond at all, but he said that um, you've kind of got like the the mooks, mm. uh, nameless mooks. Which they don't even have a name badge. That's how bad they are. <laughs> and all you need to do to actually um, to kill them is just to succeed at your role. Yeah. You yeah. don't need to have any additional points of uh, damage. I don't have like a thing is one hit is like because you're that heroic. You just as soon as you hit them, it's dead. It's part of the hero system. Yeah. And this is what I actually find kind of, kind of interesting about the gaming industry at the moment is everybody is going towards this more heroic sort of the cinematic sort of the system. The engine is built for the book. To be heroic, Star Wars and Edge of Empire, they're doing it. They've got the whole heroic systems, and everyone seems to be moving on this. Cinematic. Uh, yeah, the cinematic side of it. But then, and this is what this James Bond book's done, effectively. You know, uh, Victorian, uh, Victory Games have done. They did this ages ago, and then it just completely died out. And now we're going back to that sort of side of things again, mm. which is kind of good. So it makes me think that these guys, they knew what they were doing when they built this game at the beginning. You know, it's not a perfect system. It's got its flaws like every other system. Uh, but then, you know, GMs should be filling in that sort of side anyway. So they really created a really unique piece here. Any uh, other spy-oriented game system you think would be great to, to run a, a few James Bond scenarios or a campaign? I, mean, if, I think with any game system out there, you can adapt it. You mean, you don't, mm. if you pick a role-playing book... You don't have to go, oh, well, this is uh, World of Darkness Vampire. I must be using that background. You can put that and use their game mechanic system for your worlds. I've I've done it in in Seven Seas. I did a completely, I changed the background. I just used the system itself to run a realistic historic pirate game. You know, that's when you play the hero. And I said, no, you're playing the villain in this. You're going to be the hero villain. And I swapped the whole thing around. A lot of people said it wouldn't work. I think it worked nicely. I just used the system. I think you can just use the, the engine itself yeah, of the book. But the engine still, personally, I find that different engines are different things they concentrate on. Uh, I got a, another game here, uh, which I'm continuing to, to master someday. Uh, it's called Cold City, and uh, well, again, it's an indie game. And there, the system is all based around the trust you have in other people. So the characters themselves are expected, maybe they can betray each other. And uh, the way it works is that the more trust you put in the team, the more dice you receive. But then if someone turns against another, you can use those dice as well. So there's sort of a dynamic of all you're going to play or you're going to interact, which is built into the system. I haven't played it yet, so I don't know how, how, how successful uh, it would be. I haven't played this one at all. I have heard about it. And quite a few of my friends have been talking about it. And it's certainly on my list to play. What, what memories would you have? Uh, you said you, you, you played with the James Bond system. Well... Any good story or such a long time? It's when I practically because I started role playing when I was like nine years old. I so think you were like, a player or a game master? Then? I was a player when I first started. So what was the team like? <laughs> it was just me and a friend on the board playing D and D. You know, moving the figure around and making this big map. And I can, I can barely may remember it. It was complete craziness back then. Uh, I don't even think it was role playing then. I think we were just rolling the dice and going, right, must go this direction. And I think James got a similar sort of story from his experience of you must go this direction. So looking back at it, I didn't even feel it was a proper role playing experience really. It was more I can hear the hoodish music playing around. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was it was like the old <laughs> But no, it was a blur. You've got long hair. It's not far off the no truth, to be honest. <laughs> Um, but no, I, I can't remember. I think it was a few years after I played the, the James Bonds and because mm-hmm. I was really into James Bonds. Uh, someone said, oh, do you want to do a role-playing game? I was like, yeah, sure. And it was completely different. I think because we, we were really young, we changed the whole thing. I think it was more like we were a mutant animals. <laughs> they actually, carry, but, you know, it's the craziest thing you do as kids. And I think I was like uh, some form of cat man. 
sort of thing, double uh, O cat agent or something like that. <laughs> it's crazy, I know. You know, you know what would you do now at 13, 14 years old? You come up with these crazy sort of stuff. So yeah, um, that's about all I can remember of it, apart from it would just be wacky and crazy. James, you, you, from what I understand, you never played the James Bond system? No, no, I've not. It was something that's very... Uh... Is it something as a, a game master you would consider playing, running a, a game in the in James Bond universe? So that, now that we're talking about it, are you... Are there any ideas popping? You'd be good at it. I think you'd be really um, good at it. <laughs> to, be, to be honest, it, it depends on how much you want to, how realistic you want to, how you, you kind of need to find the, the perfect niche. Which niche way right. would you go? I mean, I've, I've in certain, certain instances, I've actually created, I, I, I like to create real world setting or a, a world setting where you could then has rules too and the players can then <coughs> see these rules go out throughout a game that i was playing recently um i was actually playing star wars so actually doing the gming of that and Which, I well you can have a very james bond style it does it does but i i presented the players with a a problem they essentially found this drugs baron's place and wanted to go in there, and they kind of basically mucked that up completely. But eventually, they got down <laughs> through the, the the lift. Uh, they didn't have to go down here. It was just they, they decided to do it. So I just filled in the blanks and created this area. And I was like, right, okay, you, you, all you were meant to do was come along, drop off the, this package of drugs, and then um, you'd get paid. Um, but they actually went down into this lift, and uh, when they actually went down there, they were, they were in a, a room, and that was completely white, very, very, very box-like, with a single door at the end. <laughs> and they were kind of stuck by it, because in my mind, I was thinking, right, okay, it's a drugs area, so they're going to be like hermetically sealed, so no air or biological stuff can get out, just in case that you're actually cutting this stuff up. So I created at each floor, there'd be an airlock you would have to go through. But it didn't say the massive word airlock, because they're not... These are drugs, drugs people, you know, illegal people. They're not going to basically go follow health and safety necessarily. You know, <laughs> yes, please uh, press button A for, you know, for this, and you know, don't forget to fill out form form two two four uh, to collect your your, your pension rights. So they've got a business move, move for it. Yeah. So anyway. <laughs> so yeah, they, they'd entered into this room and they got in there, and one of them decided to leave the door to the lift open. And in my mind, I was thinking. Right, the doors of the lift will shut, they go to open the door, the door will open. And then as soon as one of them said, the doors are going to be open, I'm going to keep the doors open, I was thinking in my mind, right, okay, so you go to the door, where the, the you know, flush and to the wall, the door handle appears to be stuck, it can't come down. Oh, right, okay, uh, is there any buttons? No. Are there any, uh, anything, uh, uh, you know, any sort of... Thing going on there, around there, anything I can press or anything I can see. No, it's just the door handle. Oh, I pulled really hard on the door handle. Right, can you make your roll? Oh, you do an excellent roll, excellent roll. If the door handle comes off. <laughs> <laughs> because there's like a pressure difference. So, uh, it's not very gentle on anybody. No, but, but then it was just basically a simple, in my mind, it was a simple problem that was, well, it wasn't even a problem. Go in the room. Let door, uh, elevator door close, <laughs> open door, you're now inside. But that simple problem could be very difficult. So in answer to your question, which way do you want to go? I think it always depends on your players because you could think in your mind something, right, this isn't even an issue. This was, it wasn't a problem for them to solve. Mm. It was just, okay, you'll go through the uh, airlock, then you'll go into the area, then we'll have stuff. But they couldn't even get past the airlock. They eventually went back upstairs after going to each floor and found the same thing. Had a massive uh, like hissy fit and burnt the whole place down. <laughs> I can see a pattern of your game, which I'm not sure I want to play it now. <laughs> no. Your James Bond game is all character. You come to the first door, all right? That's it. We're stuck on this one, guys. Trust me, we're not going to get through this door. I, I gave them chances to try and work it out, but um, they'd all failed abysmally on their roles. So I'm like, okay, fine. You don't know. You, um, you sound a bit upset. <laughs> it was just absolutely hilarious, uh, which, which I think it's it's fine as as long as it creates, you know. When they do that, it creates an opportunity for yeah. a fun scene for everyone. 
if it had been actually part of my plot, I would have actually helped them out a lot more. But this was a completely side thing. It was like a... <laughs> There's no issue. It's in your mind. It was a little niche. It was a little niche thing. There's no issue, but in your mind, you say you're going to help them out. You don't need to help them out. You just need to say, they push the handle, the door opens. <laughs> That's it. But I was like, yeah, all right. Uh, okay, no. It's not going to do that. It's like, so I tried to throw a bit of real world in there and... Um, what a mean GM you are. <laughs> okay. it's, it's good it's not in video because Gary's got a real face saying, okay, I don't want to play Gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> well, no. I mean, in, in, uh, to be brutally honest, if it had been part of the main plot, I would have given much more help. But this is a basic, you know, where plot was, they'd basically done a 180 to it. So I was like, I'm not going to help you try and give me more work. I think I really need your players to come to the WordPress website of the Rollies podcast and comment on that. So I think we'll hit a lot of views <laughs> just with that debate. back a bit to uh, general bond etc uh, moving out of role playing games but well, as I was saying in the beginning James Bond is like when you think British you see James Bond so do you think it's a good is a good poster boy for the United Kingdom I think that's already been decided by the public already because the Olympic game for example okay that was when they did Olympics, they go, right, we want to bring out the whole Britishness of the Olympic Games. So they had James Bond go up to Buckingham Palace and go, come on, let's jump out of a helicopter. <laughs> that sort of really sort of says it there straight away. And um, I think it's good. I the rest think, of the yeah. world definitely identifies yeah. James Bond as being British, even if we don't. Yeah, but there's a thing. People identify... James Bond has been British, right? I don't know to some extent. I guess I'm from Belgium. Let's say Hercule Poirot is identified as Belgian, if anyone. But uh, are you fine with that? Because that means people identify British as... Uh, I'm going to go full speed in one direction. Uh, uh, imperialistic, cold-blooded murderer, womanizer. <laughs> or you I could look at it on a nice sort of side and so, say that we're all sophisticating people we, we who, drink, uh, who drive Aston Martins. <laughs> we mostly live abroad and eat in French restaurants. <laughs> we already identified that Bond, according to Fleming, was a binge drinker, thanks to James. <laughs> <laughs> and a womanizer as well, I think. Yeah. So... I uh, yeah, I don't think people really see that sort of side of things. I think that's uh, it's trying to come out a little bit more now, the more recent Bonds. But I think classically, you know, I should Connery you can say James Bonds. Sean Connery's got moments. My favorite moment of Sean Connery is in um, uh, Thunderball, Thunderball when uh, he's dancing with uh, <laughs> with one of the what the woman working for the bad guy. And he's, he's dancing with her, and he notices people are about to shoot him, and he just 
turn quickly using the woman as a, a human that, yeah. shield, yeah. <laughs> which, which kills her, and he just sits her in a chair to say, my friend is a bit tired, do you mind if she stays here and just, he just leaves? Yeah, Sean Connery cool was quite a tough uh, guy, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but, you know, but I don't think the entire world will look at the English just for that moment. So I think they'll look at all the other good moments. But so. when you look at Bond as Britons, because you're the only Britons I had on the podcast so far, do you look at him and say, "Yeah, that's that's us. We like that." I do. Know, I don't think I've ever looked at it like that before. I think. I think. I think. If you look back throughout the Bond history. It, it it does say something quintessentially has quintessential Britishness to it. That it has uh I mean it was filmed here in, in London studios in Plymouth Studio. Yeah. And it's still used for quite a lot of filming in even a lot of big Hollywood films. Yeah. They film a lot of bits there. Star Wars with yeah, shut down. Yeah. Um so I think that the for industry and for the last, you know, what should we say, post Cold War no wait post end of Cold War, sorry, um, where it actually came about, it did sort of, sh- it was showing off our great technology, our great area to the rest of the world, that uh, that we could actually say how great Britain was. And I think that, even if we don't believe it, it, it has had a, a sense that, that people actually picked up on this. And I think that, in part, it's kind of reflected back to us because we, we, we are all thinking that, you know, James Bond is a symbol of being British. We, we may... I think that's a great thing about being British, actually. Mm. We can both love something and hate something at the same time. Mm-hmm. Uh, that we can basically go, yeah, but, you know, it's James Bond. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's funny thinking about Britishness, James Bond. Uh, an aspect of James Bond which is quite fascinating is that, okay, he's the greatest spy in the world, and there's this kind of MI6 is like the spy agency. Mm. And it's a bit funny because it's compared to other point of views and medias and stories. Uh, you would think it's the CIA or the Soviet Union and you've got this sort of underdog country, European, uh, United Kingdom, always being like, those guys at the CIA, <laughs> they, they, they cannot do their job properly. Uh, I quite like the, this aspect of Bond that the fact he's is not exactly working for the biggest player in the thing. This kind it's his of arrogance to him, I think. Isn't yeah, he's been arrogant, and I think that's a bit of a, no offense to other British people, but I think he's got that arrogance, which is kind of characteristic to the British. Well, we can be a bit arrogant at times. Oh, definitely. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, no one goes to watch James Bond because they know it's going to be factually accurate. Oh no, no, <laughs> really. <laughs> I, I mean, thought that. I swear I mean, that was all real. You, know, you look at the uh, the Born sister, uh, the Born films. They actually did this to actually make it, you know, all the grittier, grittier clothes, and actually using anything as a weapon, like a proper, you know, if you could call it a proper spy film. Um, whereas James Bond is the the highlight life of spy films. Yeah, you're the uh, the business, the white collar criminals. <laughs> it's, it's not about being realistic or not. It's sort of this place in the the collective mind, whatever that might be, which which Bond have, and yeah, it says English. I don't know if if you say uh, American, that would be John Wayne, or I don't know, maybe uh, I don't know Indiana Jones as a symbol of like the biggest American characters. Out there, I know in France, that would be, uh, I don't know, actually, uh, Eric Cantona. I think, if I think the movie, I think France would be Musketeers, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Musketeers. You, yeah. You're, you're so I, I, I see what you're saying. So you say American movie, John Wayne, France, Musketeers, also. Awesome. Yeah. And then right? a few English, yeah, James Bond. Yeah, you've got Robin Hood yeah. and Sherlock Holmes also, but... Uh, yeah, yeah, that Perhaps that's, very, that's, a, that's a very good point on it, then, in a sense, because if you look at it, it's like, America's so big. It's like, you know, it's got states, so many states in there that are broken up into their own little unique identities, that if you ask someone from Alaska, basically, like, you know, would you think that uh, John Wayne represents you very well? I think, no. <laughs> but, you know, everyone could kind of represent a certain point of James Bond-ness, that you've got, like, his Scottish roots, his uh, alcoholicness and womanising, 
Uh, so very, very uh, British uh, elements there. You're, you're, you're painting a really bad James Bond, you know. No, 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 for example. Um, no, no, it's class. I mean, he wears a suit. Class. He's the best guy, imaginary guy ever, yeah. would be the best dressed. The yeah, best, best wearing a suit. And if English, Britons are good at something, he's wearing a, a suit. At least in the imagination, you think French... You think uh, relaxed, uh, drinking a red glass of wine. You think Belgium. You don't think positive things. Uh, it's mostly <laughs> overweight, <laughs> breezy. Uh, but you think English. You see, well, sharp, classy, suited guy. I think personally, and James Bond is is definitely. You think American. You think I don't know more muscular action movie. That's why I love Casino Royale so much because the action scenes were good. But you got the casino scenes and the smooth scenes. I think it's harder when you're when you're a British person and you look at something else British because it's all part of who we are already, sort of thing. It's harder to see that. But then when you see something as another country looking and you you know look at that, these things are much more clearer to that person. The, the, so, I'm not saying they're accurate, yeah. but, but no, I think no, I'm it's saying it's, it's 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 very hard to look at yeah. James Bond and go, yeah, the suit things. So I never really thought about the suit thing until you said it, and I was just like, actually, you're right. If you're looking outside to the British and what the British are like, suits and all that, and James Bond in the suit. But I never, see, I don't see that because to me, it's sort of it's a natural thing. It's all around us. The it tailored, sort of points it you know, out. the tailored thing, like yeah, the tailored fit. You know, in French, the, it's it's not the real sentence you use nowadays, but it's known for among French people. It's sort of a joke that the French, uh, the first sentence you learn in English is. My tailor is rich. Really? Yeah, which it's really weird. Uh, I think it was because of a really old dictionary that was the first thing translated. It was an expression. So it was my tailor is rich. And everybody know that sentence sort of in, in France. Yeah, you got French fashion, which is a big thing. Yeah. But it's more for women. When you're into suits, it's, it's really the, definitely the, the Britishness, the, the bowler hat and the, you know, city worker and this sort of things so you come yeah. to mind. I want the bowler hat back. <laughs> I, I want, want hat jobs. back. Odd yeah, job. odd job. <laughs> so you can do the odd job move from pro it. I want my Infra Bogart time being back, although... Actually, I'd say the suit thing, thinking about it, is what my father told me was an important thing. He said to me as you're growing up, he said, make sure you buy a good suit in life. So, yeah, I can sort of, sort of really start to see this pitch now he pointed it out. Coming out of Spectre... So, I've been impressed by the first 10 minutes. It's actually a very long shot, and the same long shot for 10 minutes, that was very impressive. It is a long shot. And I would say that's actually the best part of the movie. Yeah. The love scene are completely, uh, for 12 years, teenagers, something, it's like... <laughs> too simple. After the action, it's just action after action after... I'm upset. I didn't have any ski. Yeah. I was not a fan of that airplane scene. Well, by the way, spoilers. So just <laughs> use the time split if you don't want to spoil yourself. <laughs> yeah, that that airplane thing. I, I get it, but yeah, I would have preferred some. Skin. There was way too much damage. And the Italian guy in his car, um, like singing and so on. Like that was yes, too. Yes, uh, yes. The what? They tried to be funny. The Italian guy in Rome. And it was his small car. Yeah. 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 Oh yeah. It was. The they tried to be funny sometimes, but yeah. it just doesn't work. Well, I like the camp. I like the camp. Toto, Shan. Filled with action. Apart, well, there's there's parts that still 007 traditionally. You start with a screen of body art, <laughs> and then you have the womanizer kind of thing, you know, <laughs> which is still the 007 staple, which I don't actually like. Um, the rest is just action. So it's entertaining, I would say. You, you still get entertained, but if you like action and rapid movement, yes. Like I said before, when I think about a English spy movie, I would think about something like Kingsman rather than um, packed of action and stuff. It's very Hollywood. I don't think Sam Mendes is good at action, actually. I didn't find the action scenes well directed. The photography is beautiful, the contrast, the colors, it's very clean, but the action, the rhythm just doesn't work. One of the good things, however, was the topic of and the plot per se, which is like the global surveillance kind of thing, which is actually happening right now. 
I'm maybe, I don't know, but I've seen like a political statement about these things. For me, it's a good plot. Like, it's not just terrorist bombing stuff. It's like, okay, we want to have something. We want information is very important. Actually, the major threat is not the bombing. It's a massive and unlimited information treasure. So that was good. I agree with um, Xani. I thought the plot was, for once, something I could understand. <laughs> um, I strangely felt empowered at the end of the, of the movie. You? Yeah, I don't know why. Was it maybe Lia Sedou who was... Uh, oh. I don't know, she was a bit of a... She was nice. She was, she was a good Bond girl. For once, actually, that was also the thing. James Bond was not alone. Most of the time, all the girls in James Bond, it's like, you know, just, okay, a movie... You kiss him and that's him. And she actually she was playing yeah, quite yeah, well. until the love scene. Yes, yeah, until yeah. Where exactly. the, what do we do now? That, that, we just kill people. Let's have it going on. Exactly. And efficient. Especially after the brilliant line of Bautista. It was no, you can't you can't say, say that. Oh shit. <laughs> oh, okay. That was the only line of him. Okay. <laughs> that's true. That's true. He's a catcher. Oh, yeah. Okay. I didn't get that. I didn't have my Honor Majesty Secret Service vibe a lot. There was the hospital thing sort of there. There were a lot of references on other movies. The, the train scene was really reminiscent of From L Russia With Love. But that's the thing. I see this action scene with Batista. It's not bad, but I would rather see the fight in From Russia With Love, which is just in one room, very old-fashioned, but still the action is better, there's more tension. Here, yeah, he goes through a lot of doors. Yeah. The only thing is actually at some point, uh, but he stays doing a spear, so when he's uh, rushing to the guy, and it's actually one of the trademark of the wrestler, Batista. So for me, it was yeah. a little, you know, okay, that was nice. Uh, but yeah, also, also, like you said, okay, this guy is very, you know, very strong and But just use a gun, right? Yeah. And you have a lot of things like that. Like, also, just after the train, actually. You're in a train, and, like, you trash everything. You trash everything. But no, the train continues nicely. You know, you can have sex with your girlfriend. Okay. And, you know, just, yes. you know, the guy just says, okay, is it your stop? You know, thank you. And, you know, <laughs> hopefully we'll come back soon. Come on. <laughs> Let's wrap this up. Final verdict on the movie. <laughs> Akadosh? Okay, I was not disappointed. I expected to be disappointed, but no, it was, it was quite good. Still good. Still a good movie. That's it. That's it. Still okay. Toto-shan. Well, entertaining, like I said. So uh, it's more due to my short-term memory. I would be entertained today, and I probably would forget it, but it was entertaining. <laughs> okay. Zenny? Yeah, it was uh, actually, at the end, it was, it was nice. It was not the best one, I guess, but it was nice. Okay. What's the Yeah, I think um, I'm with Toto-shan. I will have to see the test of time if I remember anything. But it had a nice rhythm and yeah, yeah it was good. Personally, I had low expectation. It's better than I expected. It's quite good. It's a bit long. What I really like is that they managed to pull off the Roger Moore camp, which I don't like. But they managed to pull that off, this campiness, in an interesting way, I find. Okay, so what do you expect next? Yeah, Daniel Craig pretended yeah. that he would not do any other thing, yeah. which yeah. basically he pulled off uh, Sean Connery saying, I don't want to do this anymore, pay me more. He's gonna get a lot more money and I think we'll have a couple more. Daniel Craig yeah. is like, you know what? I'm gonna do like Sean Connery and wear that wig and Roger Moore and go all the way <laughs> till 65, still playing James Bond. I think that that's what we, we're gonna have. And it's gonna be campier and campier and more crazy until okay. the point that they go to the space like Moonraker. So that's it. That was Spectre at the Marble Arch Odeon. Goodbye, guys. Thanks. No worries. Thanks, guys. Bye bye. Good night. Bye. Would you have uh, places in London or experience you would recommend for James Bond fans? London Film Museum in Covent Garden. Uh, I'm going to see it next week and they've got the largest collections of James Bond vehicles in there and gizmos and behind the scenes. The Bond in Motion just became permanent, that exhibition, because it's so successful. So Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm going to go and see it next week actually because 
the new Bond going out, uh, coming out, me and the, the missus are going to go and see it because she doesn't know anything much about Bond at all, apart from the stereotype. So I thought I'd take her along and uh, educate her. So your favourite Bond car is the DB7, the, the last one? Yes, yes, by far. Yeah, uh, more V8 uh, vintage. Yeah. vintage. The vintage, vanish. the vanish, vintage. Uh, how do you pronounce yeah, that? The, 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 the one from the, they nicknamed it the vanish. The yeah, the vanish is the last one. The 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 one from Living Daylight, the blue one, more rectangular. Quite like this one. I don't know which model that one is. <laughs> Twenty thousand. Yeah, we well, edit that out. There's another very nice exhibition. Uh, more. For the people getting stuck with a door and the nitty gritty details is the, uh, is the, the Imperial War Museum. They got secret war currently mm. and you can see actual pieces and devices which are real spy craft stuff which were actually really used by spies, uh, British spies, uh, around the world. And it's, it's quite fascinating. The, the early one, the one you would see with the Sean Connery movie, they're quite close to, to the real deal because it's a lot about concealing something as simple as a blade in a shoe mm. because then you, you can use it in a, whatever circumstance. Or an umbrella weapon or something like that. Yeah, That's the famous spy one, isn't it? The poison tip umbrella. Yeah, and then communication device in hidden something. There's a lot of stuff from World War II and or stuff they would ship to, to uh, across the front so, so the resistance, etc. Could, uh, could be able to, to use it. Out of museum, uh, a good uh, memory I have is that uh, I went for a dinner at the Shard, at the Aqua Shard, which yeah. the food was not great, but when you get in there, that's real James Bond experience. You you come upstairs and you need to go down in a sort of two level thing and you got the view at night of London and it's you could really picture yourself like buy a nice suit, go there and. Uh, yeah, that's that's the sort of the, the real. Did you deal. wear a suit? Did you do the whole suit and the whole? Image? I don't recall wearing the suit. I don't think so. I'm oh, very. Where's this? Yeah, in the shard. It's in the the shard, the Renzo it's Piano. Too, I think. Wow, I might have to try that. Oh uh, yeah, no, it's 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 really really nice. Suit I'm de out. I'm desperate about uh, suits because I'm in a job where you never have to wear wear a suit. So I have to wear one all the time. So. Mm. I work for a geek company. <laughs> <laughs> I work for a role playing company, so I just wear whatever I want to wear. So. I like the suits. I mean, if you're wanting the uh, James Bond experience and you're in London, there's a, a, quite an array of uh, places around London which you can do quite sightseeing. But if you want the sort of James Bond experience, there is a couple of places that actually you can actually pay and they'll actually, they'll actually take on a, a James Bond esque experience, like Spy for really? Day sort of thing. Yeah, pay something, I think like it's about £50 and you can go on there. That's okay. I mean, so that, that's the sort of thing, it's a good thing. But something else that you can do that's not going to cost you by, that much, you want uh -huh. to go for a drink or a dinner. I'm not going to tell you where they are because you have to do the homework yourself. You have to be James Bond yourself. There is, I know there's one place in Shoreditch. Which is a bar, which is not a bar. You go in there, it's quite a small area, there's a barman who will offer you drinks, and you think, this is a really crappy bar. Shall we go somewhere else? Unless you go up to the barman and give him the code word, he will then take you behind the bar area, towards the kitchen, open up a freezer, and you'll step inside the freezer and go down the stairs to the real bar. Nice. And so it's uh, there's quite a few places in in London where there is secret bars and cafes where you need to know about them, otherwise you ain't getting in. Nice. That sounds really good, one. I never knew that one. I need to to check this one out. How do you Google it? Secret bar bar behind a freezer. <laughs> <laughs> what would you decide for that? You'd be great as a spy. Yeah, you see, I was thinking the same. Where is Doctor No keeping his island? Why not? You can Google anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's sort of sort of my uh, not issue, but concern about James Bond is the fact that a lot of James Bond tropes they work less and less as technology becomes really advanced. I almost feel like that after Craig, they might go back. As a period movies in the sixties, I don't know. I, don't know. I, I think it, again, going back to the you know, go back in time sort of thing. I think whereas before it was a niche thing, basically showing you off the the technical wonders that they can do the uh, the, the trackers and the the knife and the shoe and all that kind of thing. You know, it's sort of the whole thing being is like if you're a spy, you should, you should need to have these because if you've got them, you could lose them. 
then you fall. If you're reliant on that, then you can't. But in the Skyfall episode uh, film, uh, they actually make a note of that he should not be a spy. Mm -hmm. He is not technically good enough. That's uh, right. <laughs> So he, he goes to shoot and he fails a shooting thing. Yeah. So that's when you can kind of see the whole need of, we actually want to keep him around. So we're going to give him some special tech to help him do his job. Uh, a better he... gun because he can't do it normally. <laughs> so okay. put, let's put a plus on this one now. The new Bond movie, what I've read, has got more gadgets in it. Yeah. And so on the trailer, he has gadgets on his car. And I don't want to say, in case some people, it's a spoiler for some people, but there's definitely some gadgets I saw in the trailer. So your theory is that actually James Bond has got, he receives gadgets because it's less and less competent. So he, it's sort of a, so he's got like an earring impairment. So he's got <laughs> an ear, earring head. He's going to have a, Zimmerframe crutches, etc. A Zimmerframe <laughs> with a frame for us on the side. This, this guy is bad at hacking. I don't know. Put an app on his phone so he can <laughs> hack instead of him. And uh, yeah, he's bad at shooting. I give him exploding pens. <laughs> this guy is insane. But uh, it does have a it does have a certain um, flavor to the reason why you forget these things, like the whole you know, sound of gun is basically they say. Yeah, it's just basically a statement, whereas uh, you know this is a signature. So I think we need, we need to move towards the end. Any good spy book or shows uh, you would recommend? I think if you're wanting to get a, a little spy thing, well, there's got quite a few books out there. One television program mm -hmm. that I've been watching, and it's already into its third season now, is uh, called The Blacklist. I was about to watch it, Ivan. Is it you recommend it? It's not, it doesn't take necessarily the, the, the point of the spy, but um, it's taking the point of a international criminal that is helping out the FBI. Okay. And the way he does it is James Spader plays, uh, plays the, main, the main protagonist. I love this he, guy. He, he actually plays it incredibly well. Very charismatic, and it's like kind of like the ultimate middleman. He basically's got his own agenda. He doesn't. He's not letting everybody, everybody else know. So then, as he progresses, you kind of see that how th certain things are kind of linked together. As they've done a bit of their bit of action, and he sort of he's got a, a grand plan, and it does look very good because it does have a lot of uh, future uh, playability in it. So I think I would recommend uh, if you like James Bond, and maybe you want to go through the all the movies again, but you don't have time to actually watch them. I would recommend listening to the James Bonding. Podcast uh, by oh. Matt Myra and Matt Gawley. I have heard it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite it's nice. Good. It's quite they're nice. Very very comical as well. Yeah, and they're, they're very big fans, so they, they got into the detail. They're really into suits. So if you want the references of uh, the the suits, it's quite nice. Uh, yeah, to so know uh, the James Bonding podcast, uh, uh, I would recommend. Gary, anything else to add before we we close this one? No. Okay, great. Apart from watch the new Bond movie, because this can be awesome. It's Bond. Yeah, it's let's, good. let's find out. I hope it will be, should be good. Mm. This was the Rollies podcast, mm. special James Bond. Thanks, uh, James and Gary, for joining us. You're welcome. Send your best uh, Bond moment and any comment you would have, uh, especially about James' approach to opening doors. <laughs> <laughs> Stay tuned for our next episode. And in the meantime, um, have good games. Good game. This episode included Her Majesty by Garnish, Banging on My Door by Wellen Taunton, and as usual, Solta o Franco by Bonde de Roll. All these songs are available on the freemusicarchive.org. In addition, we have James Bond themes and songs, respectively by John Barry, the Monty Norman Orchestra, Thomas Newman, and Sam Smith. We still have this project for a crossover episode with a French podcast. As part of this, I would be very keen to read questions you might have about players across the channel or the pond, whatever side of these you might be. So please send them to me by email, Facebook or Twitter, whatever you find most convenient. Thanks for listening. Alegria da moçada da perua Favelada, nosso som é fantasia Pra mamãe, vovó, titia Rolê, rolê, rolê Solta o frango e vem com a gente Rolê, rolê, rolê Solta o 
frango e vem com a gente. Nós é tipo bem Jesus, todo mundo a gente ama. Ainda mais se for gatinha, rola até levar pra cama. A gente topa tudo, sapatão e picodudo na hora do piriri. Cai em mim outra vez, Vai, Batuque! Rolê! 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 Solta o frango e vem com a gente. Rolê! 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 Solta o frango e vem com a gente. Me, Tyler is. Não, my Tyler is rich. My Tyler is rich.